Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? For a number of years now, Nintendo has been releasing fairly, shall we say, interesting or unique console hardware. But I've been wondering, how did they get into that habit to begin with? And is it something that they should continue doing? I suppose in some ways this episode is a little bit of a continuation or follow-up to the previous one where I talked about Nintendo Switch and a hypothetical situation in which it just fails in the marketplace. Now, this isn't really about the Switch directly, but it does have a bit of a tie-in to it. One of the things that was brought up in that previous episode about why, if the Switch were to fail, you know, why would it? One of those reasons is that the hardware is like unique and kind of confusing to people. They, they don't necessarily get it. They wouldn't necessarily understand the concept or it wouldn't fit into how they would want to play games. And the Switch is by no means the first console that Nintendo has released that's had this kind of controversy, at least at first. Nintendo has actually been doing this for quite a while and you know, when I've been thinking about it, one could say that Nintendo has been kind of innovating and, and pushing the boundaries of gaming throughout its entire lifespan. But I think the most noticeable aspects to it have really been in the last, say, 15 or so years, um, maybe a little less. But in my mind, at least, the first console that Nintendo came out with that really kind of pushed boundaries in terms of, you know, what traditional gameplay constitutes was the DS. Um, it was a bit of a risk. And as I've explained in that previous Switch video, you know, Nintendo themselves didn't even really seem 100% sure that the DS was going to do really well. They had apparently explored the concept of multiple screens, or, or touch and all of that in previous versions of Game Boys, but only finally committed to it in the early 2000s. And when the DS was launched, it actually launched alongside the Game Boy Advance, which had been out for a few years and was fairly successful. Nintendo said that you know the DS platform wouldn't replace the Game Boy Advance, and that's where I think they started with you know kind of the the idea of maybe not a hundred percent being sure that the ds was going to succeed but ultimately the ds actually did very very well for itself it, it really continued the tradition of nintendo being a powerhouse when it comes to handheld gaming and it's continued along those lines ever since at least on the handheld side uh, the ds gave way to the 3ds which was admittedly less of a change, the 3DS was really just a more powerful form of the DS with the addition of 3D, of course. But even the 3DS has done pretty well for itself, I would say, um, and, and offered a unique experience compared to more traditional handhelds, at least the few that have existed, you know, for the, for the last few years, really the only handhelds that have been made dedicated to gaming, you know, in, in recent memory have been ones from Sony. And they are very much, I think, considered like traditional gaming, you know, where it's just screen and physical controls. It's a single screen, um, you know, no fancy gimmicks, 3D or motion gestures or so much like that. I mean, the Vita kind of tacks some of those on, but they really weren't very well used. So, you know, Nintendo really kind of showed, I think at least in the portable gaming space that innovation can really do pretty well. It's the home consoles where we've seen some really kind of interesting feedback and, and concern and almost like angst um, lately. Obviously, the, the first console that really kind of broke the mold in terms of innovation and uniqueness, uh, pushing boundaries in terms of how games are played, you know, how you interact with them, was the Wii. 
And the Wii, as we all know, just went nuts. It's It's been Nintendo's biggest seller. It was something like 100 million units that Nintendo sold. Just blew away all previous console records, including the original NES and the Super NES and all the other consoles that you may think of first when you hear the name Nintendo. But the Wii just obliterated the previous records. And I know some people really didn't like the Wii. They thought it was a gimmick, you know, with it being largely motion controls based. But it was a risk for Nintendo that I think really paid off. I mean, Nintendo was having a hard time around when the Wii came out. Um, the GameCube was not doing very well. And I consider the GameCube to be a fairly traditional, you know, in air quotes, traditional kind of console in that there really weren't any gimmicks to it. You know, you, you look at it and it's like, okay, well, you know, it's a console and there's no, there's no motion, there's no 3D, there's no touch, there's no, you know, waving your, your hands in the air or anything like that. It's just, you, you know, you put a disc in and you hook it up to your TV and you plug a controller in and you play games. And it simply offered games at a better quality than what its predecessor did. Really nothing unique, crazy, new there. Um, it didn't pioneer any sort of, you know, internet connectivity technologies that went nuts. I mean, the, the, the GameCube was really the next iteration after the Nintendo 64. I mean, it, the, the big thing, that it offered over the N64, other than of course, an increase in performance and capabilities was just that it was Nintendo's first use, at least mass market use of optical discs for game storage instead of cartridges. So the Wii, even though it architecturally was actually very similar to the GameCube, um, and that's particularly the reason why the, the Wii is backward compatible with GameCube games. It, it really kind of turned convention on its head as to how you interact with the game. You know, it wasn't so much sit there mash buttons as, as much as it became more of a, you know, you are in the game. You aren't just controlling a character on screen. That character on screen is a representation of you personally. And this is really in reinforced by the concept of creating a me. You know, that's one of the first things that you would do when you'd get a Wii console is you'd build these characters that look just like you. And I think that really resonated with people. And that's why the Wii really broke into not just the casual gaming market, you know, casual gamers, people who weren't really hardcore invested into it, you know, a lot of them really like the Wii, but even people who weren't in the video games bought the Wii. I've said this before, my own parents bought a Nintendo Wii and they don't play video games, but the games were approachable and, and easy to understand and easy to control. They didn't require a whole lot of, you know, finely honed dexterity with being able to mash buttons at precise timing. You know, it, it was very easy to understand. You, you swing the Wiimote around and stuff happens on screen and you can figure that out. So one wonders, how did Nintendo end up in a scenario like that? Well, you kind of got to go back a few years. And a lot of this I should note as a caveat is just the way I've always thought of this unfolding in my own mind. Having lived through that era, I haven't done massive amounts of research on this sort of stuff. But to me, it really seems like Nintendo got backed up against the wall because it saw what happened to Sega. What's interesting is we're actually seeing kind of a mirror now that we did back then. You know, in the late 90s, and well, up through the late 90s, the, the big competitors were Nintendo and Sega. You know, NES versus Master System, Super NES versus Genesis, so on. Sony dropped a bomb on the video game market with the PlayStation. It wasn't Nintendo that killed Sega, at least in my mind. It was Sony. And when Microsoft then later on entered the market, 
it became Microsoft versus Sony as that big upcoming battle, you know, the two big powerhouses. Nintendo got pushed to be basically the next Sega, where it was coming out with really interesting and innovative hardware. I mean, I, I talked about the GameCube. I actually think the GameCube is a good system. And we're starting to see kind of an uptake in those games again um, now that people have had some time to reflect on it. You know, it's, the GameCube's actually doing not too bad for itself as a retro platform. I think Nintendo ended up in a position where they saw themselves becoming the next Sega, where they couldn't maintain doing their own thing with hardware and would become really kind of a shell of its former self and just doing software and even the software, you know, you'd have a hit every once in a while, but you know, it, it wouldn't be consistent bestseller type of titles like the other software manufacturers offer. And so I think Nintendo kind of rolled the dice and said, you know what, let's just go for it and come out with stuff that's unique. What's interesting is they've been on that path ever since. And I think that's just because of that continued battle between Sony and Microsoft. This may be a bit of a controversial statement to make, but hear me out on it. In some ways, I think the Xbox and the PlayStation platforms are boring. Not to say that they're not good consoles, because they certainly are. I own one of pretty much everything, um, except PS4 Pro, I don't have one of those. But, you know, the, they, they, they play games really well, and they offer a lot of horsepower for the money, and they've got a lot of great franchises going for them but they're kind of boring. You know, you, you think about the transition from say PlayStation 3 to PlayStation 4 or Xbox 360 to Xbox One. What, was there a big difference really between those generations? Not so much. I mean, the controllers look pretty much the same. I mean, the UI, you know, on TV, on the TV when you're you know, flip, trying to flip through games or go through the store or whatever, yeah, that's different. But once you get into a game, the only real difference is just, well, you know, you get a few more frames per second and maybe better textures. And, and now we've got this kind of rise in 4K gaming, even though it's not really true 4K resolution, but they're really just throwing more hardware at it, I guess is kind of the point I'm trying to make. Yet they're continuing to do this battle. Yes, there have been interesting peripherals that have come out for both platforms. Connect is one for, for Microsoft's side, and of course PlayStation VR, which I think is interesting, but neither of them really gained major traction in the marketplace. Neither of them were really core or essential to the experience of playing those, those, those consoles. So it still really comes down to you're just sitting on the couch mashing buttons on a wireless controller. You're not really doing anything new or different. And I think Nintendo has been kind of stuck for reasons beyond its control into this niche hardware kind of market. You know, after the Wii, we got the Wii U. And I understand the Wii U didn't do very well. And I really think that's a shame because I, I like the Wii U. I happen to understand it. I happen to get the point of it, but most people didn't. And as I mentioned in previous episodes, I think that was largely just due to bad marketing. Um, I don't think there was necessarily anything wrong with the console itself. But one then kind of wonders, you know, where does Nintendo go? Are they always going to be stuck in that niche, you know, as, as a third party, always having to do the unique thing, trying to come up with the all, you know, new and unique ideas for consoles and hoping that one of them happens to resonate. You know, we're, we're having that argument again now with Switch. Is Switch gonna do well in the marketplace? Well, we'll know, you know, a few months after this video goes live as to whether it does well or not. I just don't know right now. I've been hearing too many mixed messages. But it's, I think it's a really unfortunate position for Nintendo to be in, but at the same time, it's almost Nintendo's greatest strengths. 
I mean, while Sony and, Mar and Microsoft are sitting there battling it out between each other in this kind of horsepower race, Nintendo can sit there and really kind of do its own thing. Granted, it's got to be careful about it. It can't just go nuts with crazy ideas that would just never fly, you know, and, and hope that they continue to make money. They can't rest on their on their laurels. They can't try to continue to ride their existing franchises just on the name of the franchise. That'll only get you so far. But it it I think it does grant Nintendo an opportunity to potentially maybe come out with another Wii. You know, I, I did a little bit of research. The Wii outsold the Xbox 360 by something like 20 million units, which considering how popular the Xbox 360 was, that console was huge for that generation. That's quite an achievement on Nintendo's part. In some ways though, you wonder if Nintendo is just trying too hard now. You know, with Wii U, maybe they felt the pressure of, well, we need to do another 100 million unit seller you know, I don't think the Wii U, even with the right marketing, would have been able to do that. Same thing with Switch. You know, you wonder if they don't feel some sort of artificial internal pressure as to, you know, we, we've really got to, you know, knock one out of the park here, guys. We got to, you know, come out with, with a console that sets the world on fire. I don't think they need to do that. I think what they need to do, though, is show the potential for what gaming can become where it can go. You know, I, I hear a lot of people saying, you know, at this point, if Switch doesn't do well, Nintendo should just give up on hardware and become a software only company. I think that would probably be the worst possible outcome because that would be pretty much conceding defeat. And I think it would also set the future of gaming back by a substantial amount. In some ways, Nintendo is like the Apple of the tech or the gaming industry. You know, uh, not everyone likes Apple. A lot of people hate Apple. A lot of people think Apple products don't necessarily make sense or they're overpriced or they're too weird or whatever. You know, they're not customizable enough. They're not powerful enough for the money. A lot of people have that same argument about Nintendo stuff, but the one thing that a lot of people have difficulty refuting is that Apple is incredibly successful and it tends to push the rest of the technology industry along. You know, that innovation, even though on its own may not set the world on fire, it does set an example for the rest of the industry and starts to push it that way. I think Nintendo really has that sort of role in gaming. Not everything Nintendo does really takes off all that well, but it does get the other console makers starting to think. It, it helps push them into new ideas, new, new tangents, new technologies. I mean, Kinect didn't do all that well, but it was an interesting exercise. And Kinect, I think, was really kind of spurred on by the Wii and its motion controls. You know, PlayStation Move, same thing, even though PlayStation Move really didn't do very well at all. But I think that's really what Nintendo has kind of become, is this, this role model, almost, in, in the gaming industry. The world is better with Nintendo making hardware. I guess is kind of the easiest way for me to sum it up. And all we can do is really hope that it continues to come out with the periodic piece of hardware that does happen to set the world on fire, that does at least resonate well with the general market and, and give Nintendo some sales in order for them to continue that innovation. Not everything Nintendo comes out with is going to work well, just like not everything that you know Sony or Microsoft have come out with will work well. They just need at least to keep some cash flow going so that the lights can stay on. But in any event, I'm curious as to what you think, of course, so be sure to hit me up down in the comments below. I'm always soliciting suggestions for future topics, feedback on this one, so also feel free to get a hold of me, either through Twitter or again down in the comments. 
If you like this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at thisdoesnotcome. And as always, thanks for watching.